Good morning. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Our scripture this morning comes from Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 through 10. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat upon it. His appearance was like lightning, his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples. He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Thanks, Bob. Well, good morning. Happy Easter. Christ is risen. You know, Easter is the most important day of the year for Christians. It's why we begin our Easter Sunday morning worship services with the greeting, Christ is risen, he has risen indeed. All of Christianity hangs on that one piece of information. In fact, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 17, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Last week, we finished up our Lenten sermon series called I Will, which gave us an opportunity to look at all the baptismal vows of the United Methodist Church. Those vows are based on the work that Jesus did through his death and resurrection. And today's the day we celebrate all that Jesus has done. But before we get to the resurrection, we can't forget what happened to Jesus on Friday when he was sentenced to death by the Roman governor, when he was crucified between two criminals, enduring hours of horrible pain and suffering before finally breathing his last. New Testament scholar N.T. Wright puts it this way, the crucifixion by itself carried no meaning other than the depressingly normal one. Roman justice was once again doing what it did best, stamping out any sign of dissent. The Romans crucified tens of thousands of young Jews over the course of the first century. It was a horribly familiar event. Did you realize that Jesus being crucified wasn't out of the norm? That's how Rome did executions. That was a normal occurrence back then. So neither Jesus's followers, nor his mother, nor Pontius Pilate, nor the mocking crowds were saying to themselves as evening drew near and Jesus was taken down off of that cross and gotten ready for burial. So he died for our sins. Nobody was saying all this was done to fulfill what was said in scripture. Nobody, as far as evidence goes, had been expecting Israel's Messiah to die for the sins of the world. Nobody on the evening of Jesus' crucifixion had any idea of the revolutionary event that had just taken place. As far as anyone could tell, that was that. It was over. The disciples who had been following Jesus for three years were in hiding, in fear that they would get arrested and beaten and crucified. Then we moved to Saturday, and guess what? Jesus was still dead. The disciples were still in hiding. What would it take for those frightened, grief-stricken, and depressed group of disciples to rebound from that dark place and, and go forward following the arrest, the trial, and the execution of the man who they thought would be their Messiah? It's clear that if the defining moment of our story ended with Jesus' burial, 
Today, there would probably not even be a Christian faith. But early on Sunday morning, the women who followed Jesus went to the tomb and an angel shows up and says, I know you're looking for Jesus, the one who was crucified. He's not here. He's risen, just like he said. The resurrection is the ultimate decisive event in human history. It's not something that's merely spectacular that happened to Jesus. The resurrection is not merely believing that a dead body came back to life or that the tomb was empty on Easter morning. The resurrection is not merely a happy ending to an almost tragic story of Jesus. The richly diverse early church was united in an allegiance to Jesus and a belief in his death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead. One scholar said it this way, Jesus Christ is the center of gravity in the story of the one who was, the one who is, and the one who is to come. So the resurrection is not a doctrine about Jesus. The resurrection is an ongoing life with Jesus. The story of Easter Sunday fills our broken hearts with joy, fills our souls with hope, fills our mouths with praise. Amen? That's what it's about. Unfortunately, in our world, so many people seem to be offended by the resurrection because they would tell you that reason would say it's impossible for somebody to be raised from the dead. Granted, the disciples feeling like Jesus was still present with them in spirit is credible, but the story of the empty tomb is dismissed, as some scholars say, as pious legend. You know, just this past week, I had the opportunity to teach our confirmation class. And the confirmation kids were told to come up with questions to stump the pastor. So I knew going in to be ready for anything. But one of the questions that one of the kids asked, I think really might resonate with all of you this morning. Listen to this question from one of our eighth graders, I think. If Jesus rose from the dead and God wants us to believe that, why doesn't Jesus just show up so we can see him? That's a great question. That's kind of what we started off with. I knew the night was gonna be good at that point, right? (laughs) And like the confirmands, we ourselves might be in that same boat. I mean, if Jesus would just walk through those doors and walk down the center aisle and stand right here, it'd be easy to believe that he rose from the dead, right? We would be able to see him with our own eyes. We would be able to touch him. Our doubts would just go away. And if we can't do that, sometimes it's hard to to believe that it actually happened. And if that's you, don't worry, you're in good company. In fact, if you read all the accounts of what happened after Jesus' death in Scripture, you'll see that the disciples believed only once they saw Jesus for themselves. John believed when he found the grave clothes folded in the empty tomb. Mary Magdalene believed when she saw Jesus face to face. The rest of the disciples believed when Jesus appeared in the room where they were in hiding. Except, of course, for Thomas, Thomas was out running some sort of stupid errand and missed Jesus showing up at all. So when he got back home, all he had to go on was the fact that the disciples said Jesus was here. And he's like, yeah, right. I'm not gonna believe unless I see it for myself. You know, I would agree with what a former professor of mine once said. I hate not being in the room when a miracle occurs. Right? It's not that I I don't feel good for the people that experienced the miracle, that's awesome but I'd love to experience it myself and not just hear it secondhand so I can feel how Thomas felt. You know, I'm reminded of a story that I read about that happened in 1988, 1998 actually, in the southeastern part of our country when tornadoes were ripping through and destroying all kinds of stuff, kind of like what's been happening over the last couple of weeks. And after one of the days of devastation, NPR National Radio public radio had a story or a show called All Things Considered. And they had a story about a church called the Church of the Open Door. And what happened was there were kids there, choir kids, practicing, getting ready for Sunday morning. And the pastor saw the tornado heading towards the church. So the pastor gathered all of the kids and went into the church's main hallway. And they all huddled together while the winds tore the church apart. And the kids were scared and tried to calm their fear. The pastor led them in singing, Jesus loves the little children. Miraculously, although some of the kids were hurt, none of them were killed. 
The most amazing part of the story in the broadcast was the story of a little girl who said while they were singing, she saw angels holding up the hallway. And at one point the angels said, we can't do it anymore. It's too hard. And more angels showed up to hold up the hallway. That little girl will never forget what she saw. She will always believe that there are angels watching over her. And if there isn't enough, God will just send in reinforcements. That's an amazing story. None of us were there. All we have to go on is the story of that little girl. Angels are a pretty popular topic in our culture today. I hear people talking about angels all the time. As far as I know, I've never met or seen an angel, at least not the way they're described in the Bible. Although it does say we may entertain angels without even knowing it, so who knows, maybe I have. What we do know is there was an angel present on that Easter morning sitting at the tomb. And when the women showed up, he says, Jesus isn't here, he is risen. None of us were there. All we have to go on is the word of the women that showed up. So I understand what Thomas felt like when he said, I wanna see for myself. I don't believe is what Thomas said. As a pastor, I hear the words, I don't believe all the time. I hear people say to me, I don't believe I can ever love again after I, what I went through in my last relationship. I don't believe I'm ever gonna be healthy after what the doctor told me. I don't believe I can ever work through the grief I'm feeling right now after the loss of a loved one. I don't believe I'm ever gonna get out of this horrible job that I have, not with the bills I have to pay and the family responsibilities that I have. I don't believe we're ever gonna be able to see people work together in spite of their differences. Well, all that doubt, all that fear is rooted in whether, whether we wanna admit it or not. It's rooted in the fact of our inability to believe that Jesus rose from the dead. Because if we believed Jesus conquered death and walked out of that grave, then we wouldn't be surprised to discover that he's still at work in our lives and in this world. The resurrection of Jesus's body back to life means that God entered this life and gives us real hope to real problems. Jesus's bodily resurrection proclaims that God makes a response to us. So when our bodies are broken down, God is with us. When our bodies are experiencing abuse or loneliness, God is with us. To people who feel like they're nobody, God is with them. It's the basis for everything we have to say about the sacredness of human life, about our mission, about our concern for others. And it's what gives us the strength to join in the battle to fight the powers of evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves like we talked about as part of our baptismal vows. Why? Because in the resurrection of Jesus, God has proclaimed that this world matters. God is with the little children huddled together trying to get through the storms of life. And God is with us as we try to navigate this world that we live in. If Jesus can defeat death, Nothing will stop Jesus' resolve to save our lives. That makes this world filled with possibilities. Christians believe that Easter is a crucial part of the story. Christianity is founded on the historical claim that Jesus rose from the grave, making it either the greatest significant fact in the history of the world or a giant sham. According to the story of Jesus' resurrection in Matthew, the final instructions, if you read the rest of the chapter that Jesus gives to his disciples is, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And the disciples did just that. They moved across the known world, asking people to choose for themselves whether they wanted to believe and be baptized in the name of the risen Christ. That's exactly what we want to believe. And it's why we need to see the risen Savior for ourselves. Unfortunately, all we have are secondhand accounts. We weren't in the room when the miracle happened. So for us, like many followers of Jesus, our deeper relationship comes only from choosing to believe the testimonies. We don't have scientific proof to look for like society looks for today. We didn't see it with our own eyes but we do have the testimony of people who did. 
just like that little girl who said she saw the angels protecting them during that storm. And that's not a bad thing. Think about it like this. If your spouse or a close friend had to prove their undying love for you, that wouldn't be much of a relationship, would it? I mean, loving relationships that we have with with our spouse or with our friends or the loving relationship that God insists on having with us can only survive by a means of faith that is strong enough to wrestle through the doubts and fears until we find the courage to believe. Now, if you don't have that much faith this morning, or if your faith kind of gets rocked in times of trouble, don't worry, you're not alone. We have all been there. We have all felt like that. And I wanna encourage you to ask God for faith because even our faith and our courage to believe is really a gift that comes from God. Fred Craddock is a famous preacher and he said this in one of his sermons, sometimes we believe because of what God does while other times we believe in spite of what God does. Faith is in part a mystery because faith is trust and who can explain the origins, the vitality, the dynamic, the tenacity of trust one person has in another. As in any relationship, we choose to keep trusting only because of another mystery. We love the person that we're trusting. I was trusting that I would marry my wife even though she dumped me seven times before we got married. And we've been married 25 years, so it worked out. God loved us so much, he sent his son to die for us. On this Easter morning, the question that we need to answer is, do we love and trust God? According to one scholar, Christianity is the only major faith built entirely around one single historic event, the resurrection of Jesus. And that's a claim that is unlike any claim that's ever been made. It's a report from the men and women who had suffered the devastating defeat of seeing their master's death. But it didn't last long because immediately they started telling people that Jesus had rose from the dead and they were willing to suffer imprisonment and torture and death rather than to deny what they were saying. That was the same group of people that had gone into hiding once Jesus was taken down off the cross. Now all of a sudden they're not afraid to die for Jesus. Why? because they saw Jesus for themselves. The resurrection has no value in our life if it might be true. It has value only if we learn to have faith that it is true. And when we do, something happens inside of us. We change just like those disciples did all those years ago. So who is Jesus Christ for us today? Maybe the better question is, who are we for Jesus Christ today? To be a follower of Jesus is to share in his life and his cross, and not only be a disciple of his teaching, but to be a witness of his life and death and resurrection, just like those disciples were. This Easter, my prayer is that we realize we're part of Christ's story, and that as we take on the identity of Jesus, his vision becomes our vision so we can continue living into our mission of building inclusive community, sharing Christ's transforming love. Christ is risen. risen Let's pray. Lord, we're so grateful for who you are. We're so grateful for the gift that you've given us of your son. And on this Easter, as we celebrate Jesus's resurrection from the grave, may we receive the grace and forgiveness that comes from that act. And as we receive that grace and forgiveness, may we share that message with the people that we meet so that they too can experience the grace and forgiveness that comes from a relationship with you. Thank you for loving us so much that you sent your son to die for us. And on this Easter, may we receive the greatest gift that has ever been given. We ask all of this in your son's name. And everyone said, Amen.